I'm Amy Griffiths and you're listening to Island Life. And I wanted to start this programme by telling you a little bit about myself. I'm 31 years old, married to a lovely husband and we have the most wonderful 16-month-old baby boy. My husband and I are both in full-time employment and have been since we left school or university. While we're both from the island, we moved to the UK for a few years for work but came back three years ago with the idea of getting married, starting a family and buying a house. Now we've ticked off two of those three things in that time, but the thing we're struggling to do is buy a house. Now don't be sad, cause two out of three ain't bad. No meatloaf, it ain't. But with a decent combined income and good credit scores, in theory, it shouldn't be too difficult for us to complete the set. Full disclosure, I'm not going to sit here and say that we haven't prioritised other things. Weddings aren't cheap these days, for example. And I chose to take a whole year of maternity leave with my son. But the older we get, the bigger the pressure we feel to be on the ladder. So we've been trying our best to save. But with our rent at £1,000 a month, the rising cost of living and having another mouth to feed, it's by no means been easy. And our situation's changing again, because our landlord recently told us he's selling our house, so it's currently on the market and we have to find somewhere else to live. Ideally, we'd love to be in a position to buy, but we don't have the savings for a deposit yet, so that's off the cards for the time being. And as a result, we're looking for somewhere else to rent. When we first started looking for a house when we moved back to the island at the start of 2021, it seemed like there were loads to choose from and at relatively competitive prices. There was still competition for properties, but if you didn't get one, there was at least other reasonable options. This time, though, was a very different picture. After the meeting with our landlord, I checked some of the housing websites just to have a little skeet and see what was available. So I started looking for three bed properties for £1,500 a month or less, thinking we'd have a fair few to choose from. There were three choices. Three choices on the entire island. I cannot express the fear that that instilled in me and the anxiety that felt like a ton of bricks sitting on my chest ever since. And the reason for boring you with my life story is because while spending every single day trawling through individual estate agent websites, signing up for alerts, posting in social media groups, I realised that we couldn't be alone in this situation. And that was confirmed when I tried to arrange a viewing for one property that had been put on the market in the morning and by lunchtime had already had 15 inquiries. So why is the rental market on the island so stagnant at the moment? I put that question to Mark Cooper, who's currently a landlord here. I think it's changed significantly. I think especially the private rental market. And I think there's been some significant changes where we've seen a lot of landlords exit the market, which has meant that the properties available to be rented in the private sector have decreased significantly, which I think has has been a real issue for tenants as well because sometimes they can't renew their leases sometimes they're being told that the properties they're in are going to be sold and then they're struggling to find new accommodation and some of these people are long-term tenants and it's their homes that are going so it's become unfortunate and i think sadly it has become a very hot topic with regards to this new private landlord bill that's coming in and what are the main issues that you think that are cropping up with that private landlord's bill First and foremost, it's the uncertainty. So it seems to have been forced through. The engagement with landlords was minimal, despite what was said at the time. We're looking at a document that is pages and pages and pages long. A lot of it has been cut and pasted from documents elsewhere and doesn't necessarily work on the Isle of Man. Also, there's no secondary legislation been written as yet from what we understand. We believe that will happen at some point. There's been a request that landlords voluntarily sign up to a register. Now, would you sign a contract that you haven't been able to read first? We're being asked to sign up to a register without even being able to read the contract because the secondary legislation hasn't even been written yet, let alone passed. They need to look at who is writing this legislation. I think there needs to be input from tenants. 
I think there needs to be input from letting agents. I think there needs to be input from surveyors and there needs to be input from landlords as well. So that people who actually work in this industry can give advice. Here on the Isle of Man, there does seem to be this negative perception of landlords. And, you know, you get accusations that you get sort of landlords that are buying up all of the first time buyer properties and then renting them at extortionate prices and things like that. But you don't really hear things from a landlord's perspective in terms of the challenges that are actually faced on a daily basis and how challenging it can be to run a property and rent it out. So can you just talk to me a little bit about some of those and some of the difficulties that might arise there? Listen, I'm not going to sit here and and sort of try and claim that landlords are victims. We're not. But at the same time, we we face challenges as every other people who own businesses do on this island. If we have our properties in a company, we pay 20% corporation tax, which is the highest corporation tax levied on the island. We have to look at different types of insurance to owner-occupier properties. We have to go for landlord's insurance. Also, we if, if landlords do decide to go the route of the mortgage, most banks over here will ask for a larger deposit than someone who is buying a property to reside in themselves. The other thing that we have here, which is very different to what, what we have across is, is that here the landlords pay the rates, whereas in the UK, the tenant pays the council tax. So when we've been asked previously to, to make comparisons to a rental market in the UK and to the Isle of Man, it's, it's comparing apples and oranges because the rent payable here includes many more things than it does in the UK. The government have to understand that we provide a function here. Our rental market is nowhere near as dear as it is in Jersey or Guernsey, which are probably the most similar we have to the Isle of Man. And it's a a lot more reasonable here. Also, you know, the government are looking at the strategic plan to increase the population to 100,000 people on the Isle of Man. Well, as most people are aware, when people first move to the island, they don't normally immediately buy a property. They want to rent first for 12 months to see where on the island they would wish to buy if they're in a position to. Some people are only coming here for a two-year contract sometimes. Some people are having to move rather quickly so they rent. With a, a smaller sector, that inhibits them from doing that, which means that the government's strategic plan is at risk. What I would like to see is is more dialogue, more transparency, more communication with the government so that they understand where we're coming from, we understand where they're coming from, and we head off the housing crisis that looks to be upon us. Have you ever considered, you know what, I'm going to cut my losses here and I can make a lot more money a lot more easily just having the money that I have invested into a property sitting in the bank rather than renting it, maintaining it, finding the right people to live in it. Have you thought of just thinking, you know what, well, I'm just going to sell up and just sit pretty on my cash and not bother anymore? It's something that I think every landlord has considered at one point or another, especially in the last five years. Most landlords on this island want what's best for their tenants, for their property and for the island as a whole. So yes, it's something that I think every landlord at some point thinks about but would rather not go down that route. And sadly, some landlords have felt it is almost the only option they have. I have asked the Department of Infrastructure for a response to the points Mark raises there, but I'm yet to hear back. And after speaking to Mark, I could absolutely understand why lots of landlords are deciding to sell up. Why would you want to have to go to the effort of maintaining properties, paying their rates, trying to find decent tenants, when you can just have the money sitting in the bank making you a nice tidy profit each year? So how can we encourage more people on the island to become landlords? I asked David Ashford, who is currently chair of the Housing and Communities Board, exactly that. There is a worrying trend of a shortage of rental accommodation at the moment, not just across one particular bracket of rental, but across all the different brackets. I know there's people struggling, for instance, with children and also with pets to be able to find um, accommodation, but also people who are single as well, trying to find something within the right price point. The market seems to have very, very much contracted, particularly over the last 12 months. For a start, you have the current interest rate. There's always a myth that is out there 
that landlords are all multimillionaires owning about 50, 60 properties. They're not. There is a handful of landlords out there, and I mean literally a handful that are like that, but most landlords are people who own one, two, maybe three properties at most, who also have mortgages on those properties, and with the increasing base rate, they've seen those mortgages go up at quite a fast rate, and it has pushed their income because they can't necessarily pass all of that on to the tenant without making themselves uncompetitive. And the other side of the base rate as well, of course, is people are getting more back on their savings in the bank. So landlords are quite rightly saying, well, actually, the return I would get if I just sold this property and put that money into the bank, I'd get a bigger return than actually renting it out after you take into account wear and tear and all the other things needed for the business. And I think also there's still uncertainty about what the final regulations are going to say from the Act that went through a few years ago. And I think all of that is just at the moment creating a perfect storm so it's important we look at the rental market to see what we can do to reassure landlords and encourage them to actually remain in the market and new landlords to enter. So how will you be able to do that with the Housing and Communities Board? I mean, what impact can you actually have on this situation? So I think it's wider than just the Housing and Communities Board. I think it's government as a whole. We are a facilitator as a board. We're not a government department. We are a board that brings together all the key elements of government. And I think what we need to do is be having those conversations with landlords. We've got experienced lay people on the board as well who bring a wealth of expertise from across housing industries. And I think we need to engage out with the sector to see what are the big challenges, what are the big bars at the moment and what we can do to overcome it because it is concerning that there is at the moment a strain on the rental sector. So if it's a bigger government issue, do you think government's doing enough? I mean, the chief minister, when I've spoken to him, says, yes, we're building more homes, we're developing brownfield sites. But in this year's budget, £1 million was given to the Housing and Communities Board. Do you think that's enough? Is that going far enough? Do you think there is enough of a push to try and fix these problems that we're seeing in the housing markets? I think there is. I think there is a lot of things going on at the moment. You've listed some that the Chief Minister's laid out there. I'll add to that as well. So one of the things from a rental point of view that they were keen to get off the ground this year is the arbitration scheme, which has been long talked about but never delivered in terms of an arbitration scheme for landlords and tenants that are in dispute. So the arbitration scheme we will have up and running hopefully before the end of this year. And what we need to do as well is actually see what support and help landlords actually need. The vast majority of our landlords are basically basically people with an investment of one or two properties that have got mortgages on those properties as well. So we need to see during these difficult times what we can do to try and support them and keep them in the marketplace. You're saying it's something that you need to look at, which is great, brilliant. When? When are we going to see some of the results from this? And so when the, is the market going to be moving? Yeah, so in terms of getting the market moving, we I think we need to actually take a longer view. The governments can't just literally intervene, throw money at it and solve the problem. It's not going to be a quick fix. I'm going to be quite honest about that that. But what we need to do is actually find what the biggest blockers are with landlords and actually work with them to remove those blocks. Because as I said earlier in the interview, we not just need to keep the landlords we've got, we should be encouraging new landlords into the marketplace as well. And as I've said time and time again, this government will be judged on what it actually delivers in terms of housing, because housing underpins everything. It underpins the economic strategy, it underpins the population strategy, and now it's come forward, it underpins the tax strategy strategy as well. If we don't get housing right, we will not encourage people either to stay or come into the island. So it is the fundamental thing and we have to get it right. And how optimistic are you that that is going to happen within this administration? I am optimistic. I think the underpinning is there. The housing needs assessment has actually been completed now as well, which was a huge piece of work looking at what do we need to build when, including things to help with rental market and so on. That work was completed last month. Month, and that will now now basically underpin the work going forward while we deliver on that. Now, one of the things that's really grated since finding ourselves in this position is the number of people who've said to us, well, why don't you just buy a place? My answer is always, if only it was that easy. The average house price on the island in December 2022 was just under £387,000. So if we wanted to buy a house for that price, we'd need to save a minimum of £39,000 for a deposit, plus legal fees. So realistically, you need around £45,000 in cash to start thinking about putting in an offer on the average Isle of Man home. 
Now that is a hefty amount to save for anyone, let alone when we're in a cost of living crisis where food, fuel and heating prices just keep going up, rental prices are soaring from a lack of competition and for us childcare costs, which for context is £700 a month just for three days a week. But there is little to no support on Ireland for anyone in our income bracket trying to get on the ladder for the first time. The government does have two schemes though, which are said to be helping people on lower incomes. They're offered by the Department of Infrastructure, and I've been asking the Minister Tim Crookle about them. One of them is for brand new houses, first time buyers, and the other one is for houses that are not first time buyers, but houses that are readily available on the market, but have to come up to certain standards. So, And it's really good news in the last couple of years now, we're just over 60 people that we've helped to get into their own homes. A pot of money was put into this, the schemes, if you like, to start with, and it's just going round and round and round. So as people are moving into houses and they're paying back, any surplus is then being lent out again. So it's, it's a good news story. And so hopefully we'll be more than that next year and keep on growing it and help people because we absolutely know it's hard to get into the property market. So it's the right thing for us to be doing and I think that's the thing because at the moment as you say it is very hard to get into the property market and if we look at the schemes themselves so I mean if we look at the first home fixed one of the examples it gives is that if you're a couple with one or more children you can't earn more than £55,000 because it's targeted at low-income households and you'd only be able to buy a two or three bedroomed house for a maximum of £185,000 and To a lot of people looking for a house at the moment, those might seem quite low figures. Are the thresholds going to be looked at in the future in terms of who can apply for that in particular scheme? Yeah, we've seen the market move quite a lot in the last few years and we need to keep reviewing those figures probably annually. Those figures do seem quite low and, you know, while they're probably okay for flats and things, yeah, we need to be looking at that. And and the first time buyers, the smaller houses, the two-bedroom, we need to be looking to make sure that those... Uh, the right property is available for the right people and the families. And how much of a priority is that for the department? It's a big priority for the department and obviously the Housing and Communities Board now is getting involved in all sorts of things. So housing was seen to be, you know, an issue on the doorstep two years ago at the election and we're we're moving on on now hopefully and with David Ashford moving into the Housing and Communities Board as chairman there and the department uh, hopefully in the next year or two we'll we'll see a lot more or in fact next year we'll, we'll see a lot more action on it. And if we look at the first time choice scheme, so under that scheme, you have to save up a deposit of 5%. If we take, you know, an average house price over here, which has been floating around the £325,000 mark for the last few years, you're talking about £16,000 that needs to be saved. And how achievable is that for people here on the island in the current environment? It, it is doable, you know, as we've seen, and we have helped people in this market, but it is tight. And as we said, we need to keep reviewing those figures to make sure they're accessible to everybody. Otherwise, there's no point in running the schemes. But the schemes have been successful, and we need to keep making sure they stay successful. Do you think that the government is doing enough to help people get onto the ladder? I think it is, and I think they keep looking at the, we keep looking at the moment. But, you know, it's a case of whether we can put more money into the scheme to help more people. Money is tight at the moment, as we know, but if we can afford to, um, we'll absolutely do that. So the infrastructure minister thinks there is enough support out there, but what about the next generation of buyers? How optimistic are they feeling? Alex Cowley is 16 years old and is the chair of the Youth Timwald Housing Select Committee. I spoke to her shortly after the Treasury Minister revealed his budget for the upcoming year, where the only mention of housing was a further £1 million invested in the Housing and Community Board to continue working to ensure housing on the island is accessible, secure and affordable. It received the least amount of all the transfers made this year. And Alex doesn't think that's right. No, I don't. I think the worrying thing is the lack of plan, like within the government. The ministers were talking about how they agree that more money needs to be put aside and more things need to be looked into for housing, but nothing really was like included. When I asked the question of if it's been considered, there wasn't really a definite answer and I don't think much has been included in the budget for housing. What would you have liked to have seen? Um, I think just more money put aside for like creation of housing, social housing and um, just like the reviewing of the first time buyer scheme, putting more money into that because I think there's not a great availability for it. Whilst it's a good scheme, the availability for it's not there and I think that's due to the funding. No, yeah, I definitely would have liked to have seen more on the housing element. It was quite disappointing yeah, in that regard. Yes, yeah, so the ministers were saying about the Allen Pan, how it's looking for the future. The, but the economic and financial future, but they forget to include about the youth. You know, the youth are the future, 
and for housing, there's nothing included in that. So where are the youth when they go to find housing the first time? Where are they to go? And it was talked about a lot within the debate in terms of that being able to not only attract people here to the island, but to keep them here as well. And a big part of that is the younger generation and those who are going to be contributing to the economy. So do you feel like there is enough being done in that department? No, I don't. And I think the main like stereotypical at the minute is people thinking, oh, the 10% tax rise, people are going to want to move, people aren't going to want to live here. But I think... The bigger issue from that of not, people not wanting to live here is the fact that they can't afford to. I think that's a bigger issue on why people aren't staying here. They say they want to increase the population and, you know, for people to have families, but eventually their children are going to need housing. And at the minute, if the housing's not sufficient for the population we have, how's it going to suffice when we have 100,000? Now cast your mind back to 2021, which admittedly does seem like a long time ago now. It was the last time we had a general election on the island and there was one topic that was almost unanimously recognised as a priority needing addressing. We also need housing strategies. Fair and affordable housing. 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 Affordable housing. 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 So in the two and a half years since the election, how far have we come in tackling the housing problems on the island? I spoke to the Chief Minister Alfred Cannon a few weeks ago and asked him how much of a priority housing is to his administration. I did offer the Chief Minister an opportunity to take part in a more current interview on this topic, but I'm still waiting on a response from his office about his availability. I think we still remain committed to this. I mean, that's why we have improved our planning processes. That's why we have sought to ensure and encourage that private sector building program and doing that and achieving that target will go some way to alleviating the pressure. We are already declared last year that that we are proactively assessing now the creation of a housing association, creating a more fluid and flexible body that will be able to react, I guess, more proactively to some of these challenges. Look, there's still a lot to do in this area. I'm a little bit nervous about this word crisis. I would say, you know, the housing challenges, definitely. I mean, I absolutely accept there are challenges. I accept that cost of housing is is a concern. But we are taking a lot of steps to make sure that there is adequate housing on this island and that people have opportunities to get on the housing ladder. But we are making substantial progress towards alleviating some of those burdens. Do you feel like that progress is quick enough? Well, it's never, it's never quick enough. Look, we're never, I, I don't think anywhere is ever going to build enough social housing, for example, to satisfy absolute demand. But we make sure we've got the right blend of offering and that we are continuing to progress. So, for example, you know, not only are we building all these houses in the private sector, and of course, a proportion of those are designed then for first time buyers. Not only are we progressing with projects like the nurses' home project, but we're also now increasing capacity further with the island infrastructure scheme that will see three critical brownfield sites develop. And I'm keen to make sure that government's coordination around its strategic asset base is also as refined as it possibly can be so that we're not holding on to sites any longer than we need to. And I think there's clearly some room for improvement in that area. So there's there's a lot to do. It's a major, major piece of work for us and we're delivering. It's helping benefit the economy. We're building more houses for people, but still more is needed. So according to the Chief Minister, housing is still a top priority, but it won't be a quick fix. If only I had a magic wand, hey, then me, my husband and our baby boy would be sitting in front of the fire in our own home with a cat on my lap that we've never been allowed while renting. As the Chair of the Housing and Community Board, David Ashford, says though, maybe this time in two years. The next two years of the Housing and Communities Board has got to be about delivery, things that people can tangibly touch and see that are actually going to change it. Yeah.